This is Grand Funk Railroad. You guys back there know Grand Funk, right? <laughs> Nobody knows the band Grand Funk? The wild shirtless lyrics of Mark Farner? The bong rattling bass of Mel Shocker? The competent drum work of Don Brewer? Oh, man! If you ever get a chance, check out Grand Funk. Railroad and check out this album. It's really good. And even even Tim Tam here really enjoys this. What up, nerd? Welcome to Thursday Collection Connection, where we're playing that game. It's just an excuse to talk about records. I play the game with my brother, Plastic Eric, from the Plastic Soundwave Cult channel. And he plays every Monday. I play every Thursday. Uh, we connect albums from our own collections to the album in the other's collection, uh, one by one, week by week. And here we go. In Eric's last video, he talked about Grand Funk Railroads, uh, Caught in the Act, a live double album, which is uh, not necessarily my nemesis, but live albums have never really been my thing, uh, even from albums or artists, I should say, that I like. Uh, with maybe the only exception being Crowded House. Uh, I like Crowded House live stuff, but uh, much beyond that, I don't tend to import, you know, even if I buy the albums, I don't import them into my iTunes library so they don't come up accidentally. Eric gave me actually a, um, a compilation uh, from the Icon series of Grand Funk Railroad last year for my birthday. Uh, he's proselytizing a little bit there, um, thinking I would appreciate uh, the music of Grand Funk Railroad that he, as he said, had just sort of recently in recent years discovered. I'm coming around to it, you know, I'll, I'll get there eventually. Honestly, every time I hear Grand Funk Railroad, the first thing I think of is that Simpsons clip I opened with. Um, but as far as a connection, they perform on the album, uh, the track Some Kind of Wonderful, which is uh, a cover uh, they are not the original artist. I forget who the original artist was, but definitely made most famous by Grand Funk Railroad, some kind of wonderful. And there's a couple of songs, this version or this version, this song, some kind of wonderful, and another song with the same title that I'm not sure which of the two I couldn't find in, in my short research, uh, specifically which one lent its title to the film, the 1987 film, Some Kind of Wonderful. Uh, but it seems as likely <laughs> that it's this version uh, as much as any. And being a cover, uh, I thought of uh, another film uh, commonly attributed to John Hughes, but actually like Some Kind of Wonderful, was written by John Hughes, but actually directed by Howie Deutsch. Uh, both films, and that film, of course, is Pretty in Pink, and the psychedelic first song, Pretty in Pink, that uh, first appeared on their second album, I think, Talk, 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 maybe, and uh, was re-recorded, so in effect, a cover of their own song, um, a new version with some sax added and things, for the soundtrack of the film Pretty in Pink from 1986. Uh, some fun facts on the film first, I guess. <laughs> uh, first off, I had a huge thing for Molly Ringwald. Huge thing for Molly Ringwald. Our cat uh, was named Molly. And uh, had we not named our cat Molly, there's a good chance that our first child would have been named Molly <laughs> had we not burned it on the cat. Um, but the film Pretty in Pink was originally intended, the original ending of it, had uh, Molly Ringwald ending up with uh, John Cryer's uh, Ducky Dale. And uh, the test audiences didn't like it. And so they reshot a new ending with, uh, oh crumb, I'm gonna forget what his name is. This one. Um, in a bad wig ending up with, with him instead. And that's not what they wanted to do, and so what they ended up doing, and I picked up on this before I ever found out that it was explicitly what they were doing, is that they flipped the genders and remade the movie as some kind of wonderful 
where the protagonist, uh, Eric Stoltz in that case, uh, actually ends up with the best friend, the uh, uh, sort of down on their, not down on their luck necessarily, but the, the gritty, uh, earthy long time crushing a best friend as opposed to uh, their own crush. I definitely noticed that that was the case before ever finding out first that um, the original ending of Pretty in Pink was supposed to have uh, Molly Ringwald ending up with John Cryer's character. Um, and, and Andy, that's her name, <laughs> the, the character. I just think of her as Molly Ringwald. Um, Andy was supposed to end up with Ducky. Uh, I found that out and then uh, found out later still that some kind of wonderful, as I had noticed, was specifically just kind of pretty in pink a second time with the genders reversed and the original ending that they wanted. Uh, but that said, uh, John Hughes, huge influence on me, Breakfast Club. Uh, I first saw sneaking into the movie theater. Uh, it was R-rated, I think it's R-rated movie. And um, I was what, 13 years old, had gone to see uh, a, Dario Argento horror movie um, with uh, my brother and uh, a friend from across the street who was the, the uh, adult <laughs> of the group. And uh, that movie was Demons and it took place in a theater, in a movie theater. And uh, it was just a little bit too much for my 13 year old self who was not ready to go full horror yet. So I said, you know what? I will catch you guys later and I just snuck into the next theater over, sat down in the back. Uh, the movie was just getting started and uh, it happened to be Breakfast Club. I didn't know a thing about it. Uh, 16 Candles had come and gone uh, before I ever, uh, well, like, I guess, maybe not while we were in England, but uh, kind of shortly thereafter coming back and it was nothing, anything that was on my uh, radar. Uh, I came back around to that one later, but uh, Breakfast Club blew me away. I walked out of the theater with a new favorite movie and uh, in love with the uh, Simple Minds track, Don't You Forget About Me. And so uh, I went from, it was kind of a new experience of appreciating a song on a, on a new level, not just something that sounded good, made you want to wiggle your butt a little bit, um, and not even necessarily made you think, but made, made me feel something, you know? So I love that Simple Minds track. And indeed, uh, John Hughes movies, movies associated with John Hughes, those teen uh, films that were primarily 16 Candles, Breakfast Club, Pretty in Pink, and some kind of wonderful um, were sort of known for their music, and how and John Hughes was had was very much a fan of music and had his uh, finger on the button, and would ask uh, bands he liked, you know, to contribute songs. But of all of them, I have the some kind of wonderful soundtrack, and obviously Pretty in Pink. Um, Pretty in Pink is is the home run soundtrack album. It had everybody on it, it uh, or it didn't have everybody on it, but uh, it had some heavy hitters like the Smiths and the Echo and the Bunnymen and New Order and In Excess and the Psychedelic Furs. And even surprisingly, some of the songs from people I didn't know turned out to be some of my favorites. I love uh, Wouldn't It Be Good from the Danny Hutton hitters. Uh, it was a great little pop number. And uh, Round Round by uh, Belewis Sum, <laughs> the stupid, stupidly named Belewis <laughs> Sum. Uh, I can't, I just always want to say Belewis. I want to say it like, uh, like Rowan Atkinson would say it. But I really like those tracks. There's some of my favorites on here. And so uh, If You Leave obviously was a huge hit for OMD, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark. Um, sort of them at their most fay, uh, really kind of <laughs> that synth pop is soft uh, and for, you know, whatever, effeminate kids, um, whatever you think of that. Um, 
but I liked it. Uh, that sort of topped out uh, OMD's relevance, at least in the US. I'm not sure how they fared around the world after this, but uh, they never really scored another big hit after that. But I'm sure you know the Pretty Pink soundtrack. It's one of the premier soundtracks of the 80s. Um, certainly tops my list. And so, yeah, I just thought I would talk about John Hughes a little bit, talk about Molly Ringwald a little bit, and uh, the impression that uh, both of them left on my 80s, on my young teen years. Um, and with that, I will throw it over to Eric. You can look for his response on Monday on the Plastic Soundwave Cult. And uh, I believe that's it. I think I said my piece. So I thank you for watching. Bye-bye.